If you can give us a bit of background of, you know, how you got involved in this and when the penny dropped for you, when you woke up and you knew what was going on, and just kind of bring us in from there. Can you do that? Oh, I'd be delighted to do that. And it, it, Ireland played the biggest role in the whole whole story. Um, it's uh, many threads, of course, but uh, I think that uh, every human being must start with their own culture's ancient history yeah. before you can before you can get because remember the stuff that we're into the stuff that we're talking about is a very very big picture you mentioned about other professors and experts being in the dark and you're quite right they are because it it's not a conventional way of seeing that brings you to these kinds of insights it, it really isn't you because we know that academic subjects are very decompartmentalized and so are the minds of most of you know, the people who've got to jump through the hoops and get the PhDs and whatever. They can be intelligent. I'm not saying that they're not intelligent people. They can even be very open-minded in other areas. But when you're dealing with this kind of occult information, the greater picture, the broader picture, well, then people have to change their settings, and they have to usually do that in very, very dramatic ways. And a lot of people are not willing to do that. They may not want to let go of some of the religious for instance, understandings, you know, the Catholicism, the Protestantism, the Judaism, all that background that they've been soaked in and brought up in, you know, th not everyone in the world can just let that go. Yeah. Uh, or, for instance, it might be a class thing, or it might be a political affiliation, you see. So, I didn't really have any of that stuff. So, being in the north of Ireland, looking at all the terrorism and the violence, you either get caught up in that uh, and get sucked into taking sides and what have you, and of course that never happened. And then one thing led to another, and I think that uh, basically to cut a long story short, it started off, it, I started looking at advertising. You know, I literally it started by looking at uh, having sort of an artistic interest in advertising and starting to notice all this weird occult, what might be called, you know, subversive and also subliminal information. Mm -hmm. And then that went from looking just at TV and media and magazines out into the actual streets to start noticing what was in the architecture of the churches and in the streets and in the Masonic lodges uh, that other people walk past every day and having the faintest idea what it means. So I'm already like 13 now, 14, 15 type of thing. And uh, it started off just looking at the magazines and the way that colors were used and certain words. Why, why use that word as opposed to another word or what are these skulls doing here and what's all this weird, you know, pretty much very dark, evil uh, content doing in the billboards. I mean, I became an expert on like Guinness billboards and what have you, you know. That's, I still that's very young. I still very young. I mean, 13, 14, to be actually aware of things like that is it's incredible. <laughs> I don't even, I, yeah, that's right, I, that's why I'm struggling to almost remember how it really, because again, that must have been based on something before, uh, I can't even really remember, I think, I'll tell you what actually really happened, if you want a concrete answer, it was that one day I was sitting in art class, and this was probably 1978, 79, something like that, and a friend of mine, uh, or a guy who sitting beside me anyway, the art teacher wasn't there he, he like didn't come in or something and we're all sitting there waiting for the art teacher to come in and, and he didn't make it or something so then you know some other teacher comes in to tell you get on with your homework or whatever and on the teacher's desk was a book by Jim Fitzpatrick a very beautiful illustrated book on the ancient Irish myths and it was unusual to see that in a Protestant school but of course this book because it was so beautifully designed from an artistic point of view had been circulating amongst the teachers it was a it was the new thing in town. It was a, quite a novelty. And, of course, Jim Fitzpatrick had done, you know, that famous Chico, Che Guevara image that everybody wears in their T-shirts. That's yeah. one of his designs. Yeah. That famous uh, image, almost like that Andy Warhol look where che, che is wearing his beret. That is a Jim Fitzpatrick design. He went on to do, you know, a lot of Thin Lizzy covers. And then he'd come out with these books on the ancient Irish legends. So uh, it was on the teacher's desk. I kind of leaned over, picked it up flicked through it, not really that interested, and didn't even see that it was a story. I was looking at the pictures, but of course it was text on like the left-hand side. And it was this friend of mine that leaned over and goes, have you read that? And I mean, read, what do you mean read it? There's no words in it. And then suddenly I noticed, oh, well, yeah, there's, a, there's text here. Hmm. And he goes, yeah, but have you actually read that? And I went, no, I haven't even seen this book before. He goes, you should read that. So what I did is I stole the book and took it home. I knew I was going to bring it back, you know, <laughs> the next okay. day or whatever. I said, what the hell, you know. I'm going to just take this home because it's nearly going home time. The teacher's not here. I'll bring it back tomorrow. 
And I think that, if you want a concrete, you know, very early uh, changeover, it suddenly put me into, it actually, I'm, I'm Irish, I'm living in Ireland, but I'm not really Irish. Being Irish really means to be aware of your ancestry there, to realize what is happening in your country. And it's not just the terrorism, it's not just fighting Margaret Thatcher, it's not just the goings-on that you see on the headlines every day. There's a different Ireland there that most Irish people are not even in, in any shape or involved, involved in, even though they are unconsciously. It's in the language, it's in their words, it's in their pronunciations, it's, in, it's sort of there in the background, but people have got lost into a lot of other contemporary things. This book had a magical effect on me to say, do you mean to tell me? that this kind of Mahabharata, these kinds of wars, these kinds of conflicts, these kinds of things happen. And Jim's book was telling you about the reason for even some of these megalithic sites. You and I were talking about Lock Crew there just before the interview began. What what are they for? What's Navin for? What is Tara for? What are all, What's Newgrange all about? Mm. He was alluding to some of this stuff. So it suddenly started to make a lot of sense to me. And then, of course, that book wasn't enough. So about two years later, when I went to the States, uh, it's like that old thing that, you have almost got to go away from the mountain to see it further away. I became then obsessed with what is not what was known as Celtic. I got problems with that word, but let's leave that aside. I got infatuated, very obsessed with Irish ancient history, and you could find more books on it in those days in in, England, uh, in America, in California, than you could in Ireland. Wow! Oh, absolutely, and that's how it began. One wow. thing led to the other, and I became very, very expert then on these legends. And I know that sounds weird how that tied into looking at the advertisements, but the two did link together in the end. A lot of these threads linked up because, as I said, looking at the magazine copy and the fancy advertisements and graphics that were on television led me out into the streets, first of Ireland, to look at the architecture and then those pagan, let's say pagan or occult or even finally understand Illuminati type symbolism mm. that is in every single, the whole of Drogheda. The whole of Drogheda from the air is based on a skull, like a Templar skull. The whole city is laid out. The whole town is laid out in the shape of a Templar skull. They, you know that there are famous images, the worship of the skull, with sometimes the crossbones, but mostly the skull. Yeah. It's in lots of Templar imagery. It's in lots of Templar paintings. Well, the Templars who are behind designing a lot of the cities in Ireland and England, hugely so, hugely so, designed Drogheda specifically, and it's not the only city that bears these hallmarks, but Drogheda is a classic example, and the expert on that is my colleague Andy Power, who wrote a book called Ireland, Land of the Pharaohs. So there's uh, research that is being done. The street names, the ancient names, the ley lines, the big thing that happened next for me, after looking at the symbolism, was to realize that, wait a minute, these streets are aligned. And then I get into the whole concept of ley lines and how the actual geomantic positioning of various, uh, not only churches and convents, but also government buildings. Uh, uh, state buildings and schools and colleges, universities, the whole thing started opening up, looking at the floor plans, looking at the checkered floors, looking at the mosaics. One thing just led to another, and this is in the good old days where people could give a monkeys about anything I was doing, so I had to do it alone mm -hmm. and slowly put the pieces together, and, and one thing led to another. So it really began in Ireland, and many of the first original questions, those questions may not get answered until I went to the States, but they certainly were formed. The sort of uh, nucleus, the nascent questions that I had were formed in Ireland. But of course, at that time, I didn't have the answers. The color of the flags, you know, and the symbolism that you see and what have you. Hmm. And um, at what age did you go over to America? <clears throat> I think the first time I ever went out was about 13 for a short holiday, and then we moved somewhat on a permanent basis around when I was 15. So it was during when I was 15. This is about 1981 or something like 80, 1980, actually was then that I was able to procure one or two absolutely brilliant books on ancient Ireland and got my head into it, again, I would say in the very early stages, but it was Jim Fitzpatrick's wonderful work, and just to have to, I've said this in other interviews before, but when I actually wrote my Irish Origins book, I'd been in contact with Jim, and of course I'd sent him copies, and I begged him to help me, you know, if he would allow me to use, uh, excuse me, not with the Irish Origins, it was the Atlantis book, which was my first book, he allowed me, he gave me permission to not only use his images, but he gave me permission to, the front cover could be one of his magnificent images of uh, the old, old ancient Gaelic uh, Atlantean homelands. Mm. He had painted one of those and he gave me permission to use it on the front cover. I'm always grateful for that, you see. So it just became obsessive uh, for, through the years to study that. And, and then, of course, what happens immediately? The moment that you start really learning about any subject in detail, you'll learn that almost everything that has been written before, not all of it, but a good lot of it, is a total bogus lie. And you end up even being able to prove that. 
So now I'm not just a simple student saying, great, I'm going to read from all these people and learn what it was all about. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful life if we had that reality? No, what ends up happening is you find all these contradictions, or at least I did. I start learning, looking at the contradictions in this one scholar to this and this one book to that, and then going to the individual sites back in Ireland and listening to these ridiculous, uh, these, uh, this uh, ridiculous uh, verbiage from these tour guides. And I, everywhere I went to these museums and art galleries and try to talk to people, the stuff they're giving me is just completely inconsistent. So then my, um, you know, gander got up and just continued to move more from the mainstream literature into what now would be referred to as the alternative literature. And that's where I start finding my answers. So if today I work in that alternative field, there's a reason. It's because I had to go to that alternative field in the first place to even find out the answers that were not being answered. You know, how come the megalithic yard is more perfect in Ireland than it is anywhere else in the world? How come the, the, the way the stones are built absolutely is far more precise than it is even in the East or, or in, in South America? In Ireland, the, the most pure forms of it are be, to be found. Same thing with the language. Same thing with the, uh, the, the astronomy. The astronomy is more precise as you move into the Ireland, uh, which is the homeland of the Druids. The coming of the Romans, you know, everything that was officially said wasn't meeting the facts, not at all. In fact, it was often taking you in the wrong direction and giving you a, a pack of lies. And why, and why, why was that? Well, because they're controlled by the secret societies. Eventually, my other work, which was involved in the secret societies, showed me that the Jesuit order, and I'm not just linking, it's not just them, it's the Orange Order in the North as well, they're all one cabal. These cabals, which are run from very, very high alpha lodges of Freemasonry, who, who laugh in your face if you were to talk to them about Catholic and Protestant, they go, oh, so you fell for that one. <laughs> to them, none of those divisions make any sense at all, and this is why you can track this when you discover that behind the large doors, all these people who apparently on the surface appear to be, you know, from uh, divergent sources are actually not in the least. So by studying those guys, I suddenly find that this is how the knowledge gets controlled, that these universities are funded huge consortiums, very powerful secret societies are behind the colleges, universities, think tanks, private schools, you name it. The media especially is completely controlled, the publishers are controlled. So then you have a consensus that isn't giving you the facts. It can't be skin-wearing Neanderthals who are building places that are aligned to the constellations that even 5,000 years later are still in alignment. You can't then come and tell me in some bloody book written by so-and-so from Oxford that these were bone-chewing, skin-wearing, cave-dwelling morons. Sorry, won't work. Might work on the rest of the human race, but it certainly doesn't make sense to me. And then you find the Egyptian connection, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. I lay that all out in the Irish Origins book, how this journey begins. It's too sophisticated. The measurements are too sophisticated. The unbelievable alignments between uh, 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 megaliths that exist in Scotland on the Isle of Lewis, and that the fact that they're even aligned perfectly to, to the pyramid in Egypt. The Stonehenge is aligned geomantically, non-negotiably directly to the Pyramid of Egypt. Those people must have known each other. Why are we not being told that in the official books? See, so one thing leads to another. I think it's a case of um, divide and conquer. Now, we, we have a few questions for you, uh, Michael. We have a, a, a good few of our listeners are throwing in loads of questions there. So I'll we'll pass you off to Steve, and you go okay. through them, Steve. Yeah, there's, well, there's, there's, there's two questions uh, thus far. Michael, one, is, one question it comes from uh, one of the listeners ca uh, who's called Kelt. Um, and it's, does Michael think, now I, obviously I'm going to pronounce this wrong and I hope I don't, uh, my grasp of the Irish language is less than what it should be, uh, but do you, does Michael think that the Tua de, de Danan will come back? Now that's T-U-A-T-H-R, so I probably pronounced it wrong. No, you pronounced it right. It's Tua de Danan, the tribe of, tribe of the goddess Dan, Dana. There's, uh, there's many uh, tra translations of that word, there's many, because it depends what Gaelic you're speaking. There's ancient Gaelic, Middle, Ga Middle Celtic and modern Celtic, so it really all comes out in the wash at the end, and you pronounced it correctly. And the tribe of uh, they're coming back. He's referring to the fact that they're, when they dis when they so-called disappeared from history, it's because they transformed their form into what is now known as the fairy people. And fairy is just a bad translation of the word meaning shining ones, enlightened ones, meaning that they either moved to another dimension, as Jim Fitzpatrick uh, alludes to, and many others do as well, or they went beneath the ground into the actual hollow earth, fairy fairy world, etc. There's all sorts of interpretations. So their disappearance was a removal from the world of the mortals. It was a sad, as you know, all Irish history is a pessimistic and, and, uh, and uh, 
and sorrowful, and this was one of the key of early events that was a sorrowful removal from the world of the mortal, because the mortal was an imbecile. The mortal was weak in his mind, weak in his spirit, weak in his body. This great story of Ossian coming back to Ireland, you see, and looking at their small stature and their weak, their weak uh, physiques, and his, the Fianna were dead and gone. You know, all of this is part of the old myths. So the removal of the tribe of the fairy folk was because they now lo could no longer exist among the consciousness and the frequency of the mortals. Technically speaking, these are the Milesian Gales that most Irish people are descended from today. Well, that prehistoric race decided, you know, we're not going to exist anymore amongst this type of consciousness. And uh, that gave rise to many stories then of the whole idea of an immortal marrying a mortal. Uh, this is what you get even picked up in fiction of Tolkien and what have you. It becomes a very famous idiom in fiction of the idea of a god, a godlike woman or a godlike male marrying with a mortal and so on. So this gives rise to tons and tons of myths that are quite, quite more well known. Cool Holland, for instance, the famous Cool Holland is born from half mortal, half god, etc., etc., etc. Even Finn McCool was the same. Now, what uh, Kelt is talking about there is: is there any truth to this? idea that they may return in the same way that in British mythology there's a story that maybe Arthur and Merlin will rise and come back. You see, I, I, you know, who am I to say? I mean, it, it, that can be read on so many different levels. It can be a thing of consciousness that when each human being restores within themselves that level of gnosis that the ancients had, maybe that's what the return is. Or you can look at it as an absolute physical return. They literally ride out of the depths and they come back into our world, you know. so. It, I can't make a yay or nay statement on that. It's for every individual to... And also, this is somewhat abstract. It takes away from my work specifically. I know what he's alluding to there, but it's for every individual to sort of think this up on their own and come to an understanding. Sure, there's even people who believe that none of these myths even happen physically on the Earth. These were all uh, renditions of cosmological events, dealing with the upheavals in the sky, the coming of certain comets. You know, Lu, for instance, has been... The great god Lu has always been connected with cometary action and that the whole story of the myths of Ireland relate to cosmological events and assure if they were to return then you'd have the coming back of the gods. The whole idea of comets gave rise to the idea of witches on their broomsticks for instance is entirely related to cosmological catastrophic events that happened in our cosmos that were witnessed by our forefathers and this is even the lakes, the creation of lakes, the creation of certain features we know that of course because the famous story of Finn McCool being connected to Giant's Causeway all Irish people take this as a given but a lot of people throughout the world don't realize that even topography, geography, uh, the, the creation of certain forms in the, wor in, in the landscape are connected to cosmological events. Well, so is mythology. So in many ways, people think that Arthur, Arthur's always been connected to the, the, the bear and the pole star and what have you. So a lot of these things are about the rising and setting of constellations, the returning of some sort of catastroph catastrophic event. So you can even read it in that way, you see. So it depends what discipline you're coming from. It's a very fascinating uh, study to say about this return, the re coming back of the ancient ones, the ancient gods, and so on. It could be to do with these cosmological, astrological cycles. So we're coming up on 2012, so in a way, what Kelt's asking there is you know, quite significant, because we are coming up on a very big return, as far as the Maya and other people were concerned. We, we, will, uh, we will get to the uh, 2012, um, but... Uh, okay, Steve, you got another one there for yeah. Michael? Th th thanks for a answering that first question, yeah. because uh, th you, you just threw a lot of stuff into the mix there, stuff that I wasn't even aware of or hadn't, uh, hadn't even, even thought of, but fair play for that. Um, another question, Michael, I'm not sure... Uh, actually, I actually pr profess my ignorance. I don't know actually what this one is at all. But uh, can you ask Michael whether... Uh, his, whether to his knowledge Sco I think this is Scotia's grave near Tralee has been excavated also there are hieroglyphs in the burial mount in Northern Ireland does Michael know uh, what they say and that's uh, from Uma yeah the source on that the source on the second question is L.A. Waddell and uh, you need to go to his works L if you can yeah these people have been suppressed like nobody's business, but of course your, your listeners are welcome to email me personally and I'll put them onto the exact titles and what have you. Yeah, the, 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 the hieroglyphics that were up in the north of Ireland refer to King Menes, the coming of a king of the first dynasty of Egypt called King Menes. It's either M-E-N-E-S or M-A-N-E-S. And of course it's been long gone. The, 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 those stones have been taken away and the, even what Dell says that even when he went and was able to look at them, they were so weathered that he took the rubbings and the rubbings are in his book, but 
it's long since past the time when those have been totally uh, removed, either by the weather or by farmers or even by more sinister people going around and messing with it. But the, the ones in the north simply said that King Menes had come here and he was stung by a bee or a hornet, is actually precisely the translation, and died in Ireland and was buried up there in Nakmani. Mane being M-A-N-Y being a rendition of his name, Menes, the Nakmani in County Tyrone. And then the first question about Tralee, I would, I don't think it's ever been excavated, not officially, but that doesn't mean anything because they'll tell you something has been officially, you know, tampered with and then you find out when you go there if you have a trained eye, yeah, they've been here. And then another little anecdote there, just to be very precise about it, is that, that they have never been able to decide, nobody's been able to decide whether it's Scotia herself, that's Mera Tatten, or a granddaughter. And of course, we're never going to find that out, you know. So, I mean, but it's one of her descendants. It could be her. It could be one of her descendants. It all. There's a lot of questions that arise about the time it would have taken these people to come from Egypt and so on and so forth. And the legends are a help in some way, and then in other ways they confuse you even more because they have a way of messing up the dates. You know, it's very difficult to tell. Officially, the coming of these Malaysians, which includes Skoda, was about five six hundred B.C. I have now considerably changed. I used to believe that, but now I think it was at least a thousand before. And if it was a thousand years before, there's good reason to believe that that is in fact Scotia's grave, the actual original princess, Akhenaten's daughter. However, if more evidence comes up that says, no, you have to stick with a 500, 600, well then obviously no human being lives for 500 years. It must be either her ashes that were taken with them all through the years after she died, or it is a descendant that's actually buried there that bore her name as well. Very difficult to, to really clinch that, you know. Okay. And what does Michael think about the round towers and the work of, of Philip Callahan? Yeah, the, the, those round towers are also found in India. So, technically speaking, round towers are meant to date only from the coming of the Christians. They're not meant to be a feature that was prehistoric. Round towers are meant to be, officially, something that the Christians erected. And my first interest in those was not so much the round towers themselves, they're interesting, of course, but the positioning that they were on. Because in my mind, you see, and this is provable, most of the round towers, churches, and monasteries that were erected by the Christians were placed directly over ancient prehistoric sites. That was more my interest, in, interest not the actual buildings themselves, be they round towers or anything else. It was more like, yeah, well, so, so much for them. What were they on? Uh, that's right. what happened first. And then I subsequently found out that, wait a minute, no, we can't even go with that. The official story, like, like we said in the beginning, the introduction, that you can't trust the official sources. I now have some interest to say that, look, even these round towers, they actually do predate Christianity. The Christians weren't the first ones to put them up. The ancient prehistoric people also used round towers. There is an anecdote, for instance, in the earliest legends of Ireland, so early it's, it's, it's unbelievable, even before the coming of the Tuatha that the Fomori had a round tower on Tory Island, made of glass. So if you, you can actually find anecdotes saying that the towers existed thousands of years before the, the Christians came. And then you find another interesting anecdote is that there's prehistoric round towers in India. The only similarity is to the round towers in Ireland. So it looks like there was a menhirs. They're also called menhirs, the idea of just building a large phallic stone or a large mountain from which you can observe things. There is these anecdotes that show you that it predated the Christians after all. <laughs> okay. Um, one, another one here from uh, Crystal Hart. And please ask Michael uh, to comment on Celtic art. Um, Celtic, the, I know what she's referring to, the, like the Book of Kells and so forth and so on. Those are, again, te uh, technically based on, the, on a very late date after the coming of Christianity to Ireland, specifically with these people that I refer to a lot in my book as the Chaldees. Now the Chaldees were not these wonderful holy people that have always been put before us in Irish and British history. These were actually extremely uh, um, destructive people, or at least the Templars. The Chaldees are basically a wing of the Templar organization, and the Templars themselves are a wing of the Merovingian and Carolingian dynasties, the royal dynasties. And another wing would be uh, the, the uh, Cistercian order. So you have this, people would, if they get into this, well, all they have to do is read my book, it's all in there, or get the DVD. But if they wanted to do their own homework, they'd have to start looking into uh, Bernard de Clairvaux, the Merovingians, the Carolingians, the, the Cistercians, the Chaldees. 
But to cut a long story short, it turns out that all the royal Templar families of Europe, that means France and Germany, all those big names that we know, like Hugh de Pines and Godfrey de Bouillon and Bernard de Clairvaux, all these masters of the Templars that are in the official history books were taught by Irish monks. So they all were educated. Some of them even lived in Ireland. This has been suppressed. It was Irish Chaldean monks who later, as I said, would fund the uh, librarians and the, and the uh, scriptoriums to create the artwork that she's talking about. So uh, the artwork is very interesting, but even more interesting than that is who, who patronized it. These Chaldeans, their job, and my other name for them is the Athenists, because there's a big Egyptian tie-in here, a big European, e Eastern Egyptian tie-in. Uh, those Athenists who funded these Chaldees, the Chaldees were the people who were there to suppress the Druids, but not only suppress them, but to process their information. It wasn't just a straight colonization of murder them all and have done with it. It was a, it was a step by step colonization of murder them, yes, murder the bards, murder the Druids, but then plagiarize, cannibalize their information. And so all the writings, which you know, a lot of which you even find turning up in the Bible, the endless amount of uh, tree symbolism that you find in the Bible, uh, you know, Christ at the Mount of Olives and uh, uh, the fig leaves, and I, I can't tell you what, you know, the oak trees and the, even the crucifix being made of wood and uh, the Sermon on the Mounts and all of this stuff is out of the old Irish, out of the old Nordic British ancient, ancient legends that the Chaldees were there to process, the Templars as well. That's why they have big libraries and you don't. All that library is filled with the information that they have plagiarized that only gets to be read by members of their orders and so on and so on and so on and so on. That's why every university state building is filled with these floral motifs and green men and sun discs and what have you. I know where it all comes from now and where they got it. And that imagery that, you, uh, that the lady's talking about there, that is also, through the artwork as a red herring, uh, not a red herring, it's a, a loophole to show you that that was all based on labyrinths, mazes, the knowledge of how the brain looks, the knowledge of how the elementary canal works, the knowledge that the Druids had about how the child is born. That's why you always see a little head of a, what looks like a little man at the end of these spirals. If you get open the Book of Kells, you'll not only, they're called zoomorphic shapes because they have animals features in them, they have animal motifs in them, but you'll often see that one long little maze ends with a little human head. That's because that was the metaphor for the child coming out of the canal of the mother. And that is always in our subconscious, is coming out of the maze, coming out of the dark underworld, trying to go from the womb out into the world, you have to go through the canal of the mother. And the Druids were fascinated by this and used to draw these pictures of these mazes of how the child has to negotiate the maze in order to come out into the world and so forth and so on, uh, being swallowed by the dragon or being uh, disgorged by a serpent or a dragon, you see. So all of this stuff has nothing to do with Christianity. It's plagiarized by these Chaldees who were fascinated by this earlier Druidic stuff and couldn't but help use it and uh, repackage it under a Christian veil, as they did most of the doctrines of Christianity, I'll go so far as to say, certainly the symbolism, certainly the design of the churches, everything that you can think of that's in Christianity, almost everything, and in Judaism for that matter, is a plagiarization of the Druidic, Bardic, Nordic, um, ancient teachings, to start, including, to start, uh, including the artwork she's talking about. Does that include that the, uh, the, paganists, uh, the paganists, some of the actual symbolism and some of the uh, rituals that the pagans had, the, the Christianity took over? and Christmas being one of them? All of them. There's All not of one you can mention that wasn't. Okay. Uh, but, but the thing is that you have it even now. Mm -hmm. Don't you know, you know right now, don't you, that Obama and, and, and the Queen of England are going to set foot on the Holy Land of Ireland in May. That's right, but we heard that already. Yeah, now they got 12 months out of the year. Why May? Because anyone who knows their Irish history knows that every wave of invasion has always happened in Beltane or around Beltane or at the very least in May. You think these people don't know? These are the top boys, they know exactly, all right, Ireland's under conquest, we've finally conquered her now through the EU, which is this fascist super state run by these very atonists of, of old, and it brought, they've, they've always been having Ireland brought to its knees, but now they've really clinched it, so now she finds that she can take a holiday and come on the soil of Ireland. The moment her foot is on that land, it's like saying, I dominate you, the royal lion is here, the job has been done, Ireland no longer exists as Ireland, it's another uh, tribute state a vassal state, and Obama can't wait to get over there and double double sign it. But why on May? Why that astrological period of time? Because they know what we have forgotten, and that is all the way. Go back and read the Irish history, all the waves, the five waves of colonization. 
the five waves of invasion. I don't care who it was from, but any invading force that came to Ireland in ancient times came at the time of May. So this is an invasion. This is what it symbolically means. That they are now telling you, Ireland, you no longer exist. You are just a vassal state of the world empire, the globalist empire. And what are they hoping to achieve by coming over in May? Not that it's, you know, I know what you, you said that May is very significant, but what are they hoping to achieve by coming over here? Well, they've already achieved it, which is the suppression, symbolically and also financially, of, of, of Ireland. So when they uh, set foot on, on the soil, they're not, they're not coming over to do something. They're setting foot on the soil to say, it's done, we've done it. Uh, well, when you get into the protocol, there's many things. Pats on the backs for the people who've been their, 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 their uh, lieutenants. Yeah. Behind, behind closed doors, those people will be rewarded. Your sons and daughters now get an upgrade. You will be Lord such and such, and this, you know, and Duke such and such, and they, they hand out the awards, they hand out the money, and say, now you're going to own these corporations. You've done your piece on the board, so now we reward you in kind. Oh, oh no, that'll all take place behind doors where all the goodies are handed out to the, the, the scum that have done this. But those people, they may be Irish by birth, but they don't serve Ireland. You see, these people are internationalists, these people are atmists, these people are Freemasons. As I said, they don't, they don't go by any of these national divisions anymore. Uh, they sell a few under the package of global diversity and, and EC and all of that nonsense. And, but that's meaningless. All of these people are an international cabal, a super criminal syndicate that wants to humble and d d destroy all lands and bring all people under the umbrella of world dictatorship and world slavery. But when they've succeeded in doing it, it's at this point that you'll have these various bizarre rituals in which these dignitaries come, start glad-handing and, uh, and opening certain places and going through these rituals. It's happen it happens all the time. I've been tracking that in my work. I've written on it umpteen times that Clinton will go and get this Medal of Honor or he'll go down in South America and be standing in front of the Maya calendar. What, yeah, what day is he doing that on? What astrological period is he doing that? The declarations of war, the launching of the Euro dollar, whatever it might be. This is their rituals. It has nothing to do with us. They don't care if you know about it or you don't know about it. They operate on this pattern. They watch the, the signs of the zodiac. They watch the moon. They operate based on the 13th sign of the zodiac. It's a deep, deep arcane. They have no choice themselves. Their forefathers did it. Those forefathers teach them to do it. It's not a matter of choice. They do it because this is the way they're brought up. This is how they galvanize their power. Just and it's also the way they symbolically show, you see, everybody else what is going on. Oh, okay, just uh, just something, probably sidetracking a, li a little bit, but maybe part and parcel with this. You probably know, uh, you probably heard that we've been issued with a census, both Ireland, uh, England, Wales and Scotland. And the information contained in that census, 24 pages, is quite personal. What, would, what do you think your take would be on that? What would, what would you think that would be? Why are you asking us five years after the original, the official census came out, they're asking for such pers personal information? Well, this is not new. This has been done for probably most of the 20th century and certainly they're continuing in the 21st. They also do it by through charities as well. Anything you fill in when you, you, you belong to any charities, there's umpteen ways in which this is done. But specifically what this is to do is to find out who still isn't buying into the system. They, they know that 90% of the people, they don't even need to look at the, the things they're writing down because they're already in the bag, they're already gormless, stupid, and they bought the propaganda. What they're looking for, what the experts at the top who will then monitor this using computers and what have you, that's in, insignificant for our dialogue here, but whatever way that they will uh, monitor the results, what they're looking for is that small group of people who still show signs of rebellion, uh, discontent, uh, using their own brain. That's what they're targeting. And if they can find who those people are individually or maybe the corporations that they work for, they'll be able to target those people down the line when they feel like it. It's no better. This is very common. This is nothing. This is a no. This is not something difficult or esoteric. This is our special branch work, works. It's our MI5 work. It's a very, very, you know, known thing within the intelligence community to take various censuses. Not to, not, not because they want to monitor everybody on it. They're looking for those signs psychosocial signs that show that this person is still a free thinker, this person who runs this newspaper, or this person who's got this little business over here, or these people who run these contract contracting businesses, or this guy who's in sort of local politics or whatever, they're still using their own brain. Right, we, we mark them down, because we might have to come after them in the past, in the future. We put them in a red file. Everybody else gets into the green file. So it's a slow, methodical process run by communitarians. Anybody who knows the term communitarian, really a Fabian, Fabian network. It's all local screening, local monitoring. It's a spy network that operates to basically find churchmen, find those people who are not falling into line. That's what it's basically for. 
And what uh, what would be uh, it's, you know the, the way things are going we've had various guests on talking about the subject and we have you know one or two people saying that the actual uh, New World Order and the Global Elite actually running running not so much running scared but they're getting desperate and um, one of the instances was the shooting in Arizona uh, that politician and they're doing things openly now because they're getting desperate and there is another element who are trying to shut down the Global Elite so the good and the bad is happening at the moment with your back background and research you've done, what's your take on that? Well, I would say, again, at this point, I would say it's a bit of both, because it has been a bit of both down through the years. In order for this group to have world control, and we're talking about a very small group, so the fact that they are small, they will always be paranoid, and they will always over overreact, and they will always want control. Uh, tying into what we just talked about, imagine, for instance, there's a, a big uh, celebration in a small village. Uh, some big award ceremony, and the whole village turns out, but not the guy at number 20. What's he doing? Still sitting in the house. He doesn't want to participate. You see, that's what I'm talking about. That's where all eyes focus. The vulture is interested. Why number 20? What's he doing? Sitting home watching TV? Why didn't he come out and be part of this celebration? Uh, what's wrong with him? So you've targeted yourself, you see. And so this is how they do it through these censuses as well. Who didn't even do the census? Well, we know who they are, so that's interesting. They're still independently minded, you see. So, but coming back to your more specific question there, is of course because they're small, a small group, and because they're criminal, and because their history is filthy, the crimes on their souls, the crimes on their ancestors, the, crime, the crimes that they've committed in real time and both historically are so vile that of course no criminal wants to leave a finger mark if they, if they can get away with it. So they use the media to cover up and schmooze people into believing that it's all been worthwhile and a few apologies are thrown back and forth in the worst case scenario and, and hopefully you get so distracted with some modern garbage that's happening you won't even be thinking about history. So they, they have a whole matrix of control to make sure that you're even not thinking about their crimes or you might even go along. You might even identify with their agenda. Hey, it'll be really better to have a cashless world and a draconian state with millions of cameras. That will really kill crime. Mm. But the independent mind goes, yeah, but you created the crime that you're now trying to use the cameras and the surveillance system to stop, so I don't buy into that. Oh, well, that's one guy in, in 20 million who's worked that out. The rest of them go, it's really good. I'm safer than ever. You know, mm. what, what a, this is the human mind. They are masters of the control of the human mind. Mm. And therefore, as long as they can maintain that level of control, we have no chance. But at the same time, I'm not going to be super pessimistic because I can say that man can always take back the power of his own control. Even in the darkest dungeon draconian system, as history has also shown, there is always a spark to show that if man is able to find the fulcrum, is able to, to really gain his inner sovereign power, and I'm not like all the other conspiracy people that are my so-called associates or colleagues, I often differ on them on the means because it's my twist on it is about consciousness, not about waving flags and running around in the streets. And therefore, we have a big difference there. So, but anyway, besides that point, if, if the human race was to discover what the power is, then these guys are vanquished instantly because they're nothing but parasites. And once your system's strong enough, immune, you know, your immune system's strong enough, so to speak, uh, they will immediately evaporate. Their power, any Luciferian, any satanic power, is entirely based on the duplicity, the stupidity, and the ignorance of the host. It cannot exist any other way. So there's, that means there's always a glimmer of light. Evil contains within it the seeds of its own destruction. The moment that you're strong, wise, and knowledgeable, they cannot have any effect over you. It's simple martial arts. The, more, the, the moment that you're powerful enough to resist your enemy, they've lost. They, the, anything that they throw at you is, is, is absolutely useless because you're so immune. Your mind is so aware of the workings of the criminal mind. You're, you're so up to speed on this that you can defeat them just by standing there because they can no longer, you know, uh, do the hex. They can no longer put the spell on you. All their juju stuff and their voodoo stuff isn't working on you. But everybody else is in a slumber, a sleep, a little bit of affluence, a little bit of political power, a little bit of a status quo, a little bit of mind control. You know, and then they're under the gun. Mm. Or conflict control. No. Jews against Christians, uh, Jews against this, this guy, group against that, Catholics against Protestants. That takes care of the rest of the human race. Uh, left wing against right wing, communists against capitalists. And on and on and on and on, uh, uh, the Hindus against you know Islam, whatever it might be, they're masters of, of doing this. They're masters at this. And as long as they can keep doing that, polarizing people, polarizing by class, polarizing by religion, then they have great power. But the man who starts to see through this, or the community that starts to see through this, or the country that starts to see through this, 
are immune. Nothing can affect them. They're completely beyond it. And they will then be in a position to healthily rival these forces that mostly work on consciousness, on libido, and on these uh, more subconscious levels, you see. Go ahead. Right. Um, just, just kind of backtracking ever so slightly. So basically... See, this is kind of this. This is quite, I won't say it's after knocking me for six, but it's kind of after giving me a different angle on this whole census. I see. I I would have believed, uh, even like some some of our guests that, that are writing in, that that um, the information on the census was just kind of they they wanted to know all your your information and they want to know all your private details. But basically, the the the, the slant that you're after putting on it, Michael, now is that. They obviously know this information, and so they, yeah. they can get it anyway. So yeah. this census is not about gathering information. It's about finding out those people who, whose minds are opened, who don't want to give the information. And all, all it's doing is, is, so if I decide I'm not going to fill it out, uh, they, they will now look at, m at my non-compliance and say, ah, a free thinker. Let's, uh, so and I'll go into this, this uh, red folder, so to speak. That's right. Fill it out like you're a gormless moron, and you're, you're going to be fine. Right. right. Well, that's so interesting. Put in is the actual, you know, the average total dork or barfly, completely unconscious, you know, uh, Britney Spears fan, and you're you're sailing. <laughs> so would you would you recommend for the for the free thinkers among us, instead of doing the kind of, I suppose the 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 uh, the good feeling is to get the census form, give it back, and tell them to stick it where the sun doesn't shine. What you're saying is just fill it out and just give it back to them and just stay under the radar. Yeah. If you, if, if, you, if you know, do either one. I can't make a choice for people. They can, if they want to stay up and fight it, fight it. That's your choice. You've made the choice. You've made the decision. Or just realize what they're doing. But remember, let's, let's take it in stages. The people who are actually bringing around the census, the lower henchmen, have to be also told that it is information gathering. You don't put the very people that you're using to go out and take this census into the picture. So if you were to tell them, it's not really about that, we're going to tell you what it is, none of them know any more than those guides at the Newgrange we're putting the picture of lie through your teeth to these people. Don't tell them the great mysteries of this place or what, what we've been doing here. They don't know. So the people who are actually in charge, the, the more loc the local orgs, they may have not a faintest idea that it is any more than what the PR has told them. It's only when it gets put in, you know, been done, that later it goes to the kind of people I'm addressing that will then screen it and monitor it for a different kind of purpose. So therefore, you have to tell even the people who are going to do the legwork for you, this is what it's about. And then they run like little gremlins, all happy, happy campers, to go out there and take little census, just like any of these people with clipboards you ever see on the side of any street in any city in any town, uh, you know, for Amnesty International or this Red Cross. They believe that these charities are just wonderful and holy and everything. And if you come over to them and say, yeah, would you like me to tell you the crimes of the Red Cross? Have you any, have you any, do you know who the history is? Who, who was the founder and the Masonic organizations he was connected to or the power elites that he was connected They're the, you, They glaze over. Yeah, they just, uh, they just won't believe it, will they? they no, how would they? Would, well, you can't expect them to, because they're just little college kids who believe that they're doing charity work and they're saving the poor blacks over there and the poor this over there and the poor this over there and saving the spotted oil. What does it matter to them that these people have orchestrated genocide throughout the world? You know, one thing I, I, I really can't abide, and this is just me being kind of me being me, because I've been involved in this for a number of years, and um, I just can't avoid ignorance. And as you said, this is n ignorance has not got to do with a lack of intellect. You have p college professors and doctors who have the intellect, but the penny just doesn't drop. They just don't get it. Or you can phrase it the way I do, which is identical to what you're doing with this, with this difference. I'm not fighting the Illuminati. I'm fighting the ignorant... I don't even want to use words that I would like to use. Um, um, my, the problem is the masses of ignorant people in the way who prevent you getting the solution. If you were, if, if, if intelligent man had to fight the power elite, they'd win. Because yeah. that's what the strength is. What you have is the gormless masses who are the buffering, the packaging, the peanuts around the vase that is causing the problem. They are identifying with the master. It's, um, it's like, old he you know, remember the German philosopher Hegel, the old master-slave relationship. Mm. It's been restated in so many ways by so many other great thinkers. This master-slave relationship is ubiquitous. It's in the blood of most people. Uh, the wars, for instance, the Great World Wars, First, Second World War, the Boer War, you name all the wars that have happened in just the last hundred years. Who do you think is lying? Who do you think died on those battlefields? The genetic strength, the rebels, the people who fought evil. 
They're all gone. What's left is genetic garbage. Yeah. I have to be pumped about it. I know that sounds horrible, but that's a fact of life. Yeah. The warriors, the ones who were capable of fighting this kind of pestilence of these little men and their, bureau and their bureaucracies, lie on the fields of Flanders, man. They lie in the Marne. They lie in Passchendaele. Get me? And then you, you add to that the Crusades. Go back further in time, farther in time, further in time. What do you think those wars were? Those were wars of purgation. They were a Nephilim plan to wipe out the genetic strength of the races. Hmm. So that what's left today hasn't even got the gumption or the hard wiring to even fight back. That's why they're gormless, ignorant, what you're talking about. That's how ignorance exists. Ignorance is overlaid on a genetic passion, something that's even deeper within a person. To yeah. know to get up and there's the evil and don't you tell me it's not there. Mm. I'm not going to negotiate with these evil mm. people because in doing that I empower them more. Well, see, I believe that that even genetic will, so to speak, isn't even there today. Yeah, the will to fight. It's not like our forefathers. No, you must be joking. They fought and they're dead and that was the plan. In fact, most of the wars that were orchestrated to get them to spill their blood were completely contrived by the same Atmos Cabal uh, that I'm talking about, ergo Rothschilds, etc., etc. You know, all, you can we can get into all the names, but and I've done so in my work. But basically, the same cabal, these architects of control, have organized these ritualistic wars in order to do that: pit one powerful group against another, Frenchmen against Germans, Germans against English, Scots against these guys, Irish against them, butcher each other. And while we sit back and clink our glasses and have a ball because we know what's coming 50 years from now with your kids, mm. we'll hand them this, we'll hand them skateboards, we'll hand them video games, we'll hand them PC computers, we'll hand them, you know, uh, uh, every kind of ridiculous pop star, you know, up the, up the charts in all sorts of ludicrous fashions and they're going to follow it like the sheeple that they are because they don't even have something inside their subconscious that says no to this, no to this lie. They, in fact, they become party to the lie. That's why I'm saying that you're fighting a wall of ignorance. You're not even in, you're not even in the boxing ring of the real opponent mm. because you've got to deal with all of the sheeple in the way. Mm. And one can either say, you know, this is worth it, it's worth all that effort, or somebody might decide, you know, I think it's not worth it, I don't think it's going to happen. So the, you know, the jury's out on whether that's going to happen or not. Some, one voice will say, no, no, people are waking up. Another voice will say, no, they're getting more back to sleep. So it's really, really difficult to be able to make a broad statement like that. But, but the fact is, a lot of what you are fighting is simple, willful ignorance. Not, not willless ignorance, willful ignorance. The evidence of what we're talking about is in the face of every single person. They just refuse to see it. Yeah, exactly. And we, we come across that on a regular basis, myself and Steve. Now, we have, we have a lot of people on the chat forum, and there's loads of questions coming in. We will apologize to our listeners, because we know there's a couple of questions came in regards the Irish uh, Celtic uh, history. And there's another question came in here. So, Michael, um, uh, you're very popular and people are asking a lot of questions. So I'm going to throw this to you, but changing the kind of topic a little bit. But the question was just about what happened in Japan. And they want to know that, um, let me just find it here. Um, it's got to do with what happened in Japan. They said, do you reckon that that was actually planned using harp technology? Yes, I do. I think it's very, I think a lot of these disasters... Uh, they're finding evidence of it. They're finding neurotoxins in certain fish. They're finding sonar is the cause of a lot of the beached whales. They're finding that the oil, obviously, the, just the simple toxicity of the oceans. Um, and harp, I believe, is extremely, extremely uh, important when it comes to these massive earth changes you know, to destabilize uh, certain countries, to create imbalance in the economy and what have you, to focus people's attention outside. This is just simple, again, comes under the heading of conflict control. I'm not really up to speed on the individual cases in many, in many regards, uh, but I would certainly, yeah, I would certainly add my voice to those who think that there's something more sinister behind it. Okay, because we had a number. We had, um, obviously, Japan, we had Haiti, we had Louisiana, and uh, yeah. we had New Zealand as well. Now, obviously, I've no evidence to, pr to, to, to say um, whether it was harp or whether they were natural, but we do know that weather patterns have been changing severely, um, maybe because of the, the lead up to 2012. But what we'll do is, bef before the end of the show, we will touch base on that definitely for our listeners. Now, we're going to be bouncing from question to question because, as I say, we have a lot of people on the chat facility. And one of the things that um, Uma said that she told the census woman the last time that I would never, I would not answer some of the questions, I then saw her write down in another form, difficult person. 
That's right. So uh, it simply corroborates what I've been telling you. And this is not just now. They've been doing this for decades. This is what you have to act like a completely gormless, mindless zombie, and they're happy and they just walk away. Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, when the lady turned up my door and gave me the census, she asked for my family name, which I gave her, and then she started to ask more questions. And I said, that's it. That's all you're getting. Bye-bye. And she looked at me as if I had two heads. Yeah. Because I wouldn't yeah. give her the information. Yeah. And I said, I'm sorry, but I haven't decided whether I'm going to fill it out yet. So I don't yeah. I'm not, you're not getting any information until I make that decision. Right, right. So, yeah. But okay, um, Steve, do you want to take any more questions there? Well, like you say, they're... they're, they're Flying in fast and furious, uh, all the comments. There's, there's a lot of people on the chat box there, and a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of comments. Uh, uh, just kind of going be between people. Um, Somebody said, uh, um, "Fill it out like a Jedward fan." A Jedward. <laughs> we can understand that. Um, well, no, let's not get into that. No, we won't. Now, somebody said uh, we did have a um, a person talking about. I think it was Kelt. He said about what about reincarnation? I just, I just had that one. Yeah, right sorry, there, yeah. Steve. Yeah. This, um, is going, this is going back to obviously what you're, what you're speaking about. Uh, Obviously, five, five minutes uh, since, but uh, there was a question yeah, uh, in relation to what about what about re it says actually Michael I disagree. What about reincarnation? Well, I never I never address abstractly in my work. The reincarnation. I have my own personal thoughts about these what I refer to as abstract metaphysical uh, subject matter. I think they're fascinating. I think people should think about them. But outside my exact public persona and the work that I have, these are irrelevant. I try to keep people's focus on this world and what's happening now. I, I think one of the biggest problems of why we're in the mess we're in is because people have habitually, overly, got into escapes. And I would put these as escapes. It's, as I said, it's not that people shouldn't philosophically deeply think about it, but it has no role in my particular work because my focus is on the events and the kind of psycholo psychology of this planet, this world, right here in this time. Okay. So I have no comment about any metaphysical abstractive. Now, here's something which it kind of sidetracks a bit, but um, uh, again, kind of changes the subject. But you did talk about Ireland and the Queen and Obama coming over. Now, I actually got a book out of the library called Creating Ireland. And in that book, the researcher said that Ireland had, was never given to the Irish. We were given the authority to run the country, but it still belonged to the Crown. And I spoke to somebody else who um, we happened to be talking about this, who actually knows Irish history quite well, and he actually agreed with me, and he said the same thing. Did that, is that anything that you came across in your research? Absolutely. Uh, all these um, political demarcations uh, were, were bogus from day one. They don't add up to the paper they're written on. The British government and the people behind it, not the, not the government, but the royal, the, the royal. In fact, you only have to start studying the Guinness family and all the great families that own the corporations, and I'll include Bono and a various other cretins in this mix as well. You only have to study them and their history and their financial history and their also the family background to know that they're linked directly to 15th century Illuminati, secret intelligence, secret police, MI5, you name it, orbs from England, families, the Guinness family is connected to the Cecil family, Lord Cecil, who worked alongside Diana Spencer's ancestors, right, the Spencer, Edmund Spencer, mm -hmm. these are the founders of British Secret Service. So all these corporations that you think run England, uh, run Ireland, are uh, are actually in league with, if not the Vatican, through the Jesuit connection, which I should hope that people are aware of, and if they're not, they better become, or the direct British connection, and then behind that, to be even more specific, the Templar connection, because this movement of these Templars into Britain, and when I say movement into Britain, I mean the taking over of the, of the stately homes, the Templar presence in Ireland should be studied. Uh, most people know it as the Norman invasion. Norman invasion, my ass. William the Conqueror was ahead of the, he was ahead, he was one of the top figures in the Templar Brotherhood, the, the Merovingian dynasty. It was taught to school kids as the Norman invasion, the Battle of Hastings, the, you know, the Fitzgeralds and what have you, and then the Kilkenny, statutes of Kilkenny and all of this. We know about it in a more of a loose way. But that's not the coming of the French. That's the coming of the, the royal French, the, the Merovingians, the Templars, the desecrators. These individuals came over, took over, do you think they're going to hand the Irish people? They killed off, I don't know, uh, millions. Three quarters of the population of Southern Ireland were wiped out during the coming of the Normans. I have the figures somewhere. It's, it's in the tune of millions. 
That's not even to mention what later happened with Oliver Cromwell and the overt period under Adrian V and, and uh, 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 the Pope at the time. You see, Adrian, more millions killed. So they would already pretty much annihilated the entire population of Ireland. Do you think then they're going to turn around and politically hand over the country to those people? Of course not. It's the same thing that the Rustle Trust and Skull and Bones, right, who were connected to the British East India Company and the Hudson Bay Company have done in America. Not one square inch of the North of America is actually owned by the American people. That constitution isn't worth a paper it's written on, and I can prove it. I've written on it. And it's the same thing in Ireland. These are vassal states. They always have been. But you see, people have short lives, so they're lieutenants live, die, and then you need to replace them, don't you? These families retire, then you need a new coterie of families to create the new gormless um, punch and duty presidents and deans of colleges and deans of, of, of museums and heads of, of organizations. Who's gonna, who are all the ants, the worker ants? They come and they go. So you, unfortunately, the, the elite have to always, always, always continue the wheels of control. And that's done through the fraternities, the universities, educate them, teach them what is up, give them the benefits when they show that they're going along with the gig. Then you reward them enormously. You give them businesses. You give them the rights. You give them political status. And so after a hundred years or so, you have what you have now, with an incredible monopolization from South Africa to Japan to, to Ireland, all one universe of dollars of these uh, termites, these worker ants mm. who work in the system and then their job is to purge those who don't go along with the gig. And that's how you have this incredible consensus. This is one of the reasons why nothing changes. How can anything change? The heads of the banks, the heads of the, the, the various trusts, the think tanks. Tara, look at who's behind that. You think the National Trust has any clout? But again, going back to that Templar presence, the great mansions and the positioning of those mansions and the power of the Templar families, Sinclair, Menzies, Rosemont, the list of names goes on, you know, Beaumont, etc. All of these people who are head of BBC and head of ITV and who, who's, who's head of RTE, what are their behind the scenes connections? They're bowing and scraping to the very royals and on the surface they may, you know, humorously or in other ways, make it look like they're opponents of. They're not opponents of. It's all full. It's all bogus. They're all in bed together financially. They're all one big powerful coterie. That's how Ireland got sold out in the first place. Well, and that gets done through the media. It's uh, divide and conquer. Now, I, I, down the line, we know they want to have a, a global government, a one world government. And divide and conquer works for them now at the moment because people are in fighting and it keeps... Um, it keeps people's eyes off what they're doing. But down the line, I have my own theory of how they're going to get this one world government using problem, reaction, solution. Do you have your, can we have your feelings on how you think they're going to get people all of a sudden to stop fighting and be together? Well, that's an elaborate thing I've gone into in Architects of Control DVD about how, the, how this control of the mind works. So it's, 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 uh, more, you know, coming out and telling people that the way they control people is through the mind and through consciousness, that's a nice friendly statement. I've always gone further than that to show exactly how it's done. And they know that in the soul of man there is a need for peace. They know that man's mind is deeply traumatized from ancient times. Catastrophes and all sorts of, I, I even include genetic interference into this, but let's leave that aside. All, all I can say briefly is that they know that the human mind is divided. You have conscience, consciousness and you have unconsciousness. You have right brain and you have left brain. You have frontal lobe and you've got the more primitive limbic realms. You've got sleeping and you've got waking. Right? They know that man in almost every single aspect of his life is a divided creature. You have masculine traits and you've got feminine traits. You know? So the whole of human being, the whole of what constitutes a human is divided in its essence. Maybe at one time in ancient times it wasn't. But that's merely speculative. All we know that in recorded history, man is a divided, violent, fragmented, insecure, deeply insecure creature. And then because he's emotionally insecure, you can hand him any kind of God that you can dig up, any kind of Moloch, any kind of Jehovah, and they're on their knees worshipping him. It doesn't matter if it's blood soaked. It doesn't matter if it makes not an ounce of logical sense. They'll worship it. And then they're intellectually schizoid. So then, you know, one thing leads to the other. It's an incredible psychological matrix of so psychosocial control. That's what I'm trying to show in my work that distinguishes my work from other people. It's involved in psychology, philosophy, conspiracy, history. Okay. Then they move along these lines. If you can control the mind, you, that person is already your slave 
And his his body follows, doesn't it? His objectives, does, his yeah. expectations, his his uh, desires, everything else in his mind. If you once you've controlled his psyche, everything else follows, and you have your world controlled. But the root of the world control isn't in controlling his body, although that exists, of course. Uh, it's a it's a phalange action, isn't it? Any military action is two phalanges. It's it's a pincer movement. Yeah. But the point, is, and then I'm not I'm not this including the fact that you know the control of the habitat, fluoride, uh, blah blah blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, living in cities, yeah, uh, it's all included. But none of that would work without the control of the mind. So my work entirely focuses on the control of consciousness. That's where is the most greatest secret because also that's where the solution is the solution is not in fixing all the other broken china uh, you may you make a you may if you try to live your life to do that you may have a few successes but that's like a single drop of, of ink in a gallon of water it's there but it hasn't changed the complexion of the water and then all the other evil that happens is just erasing it the only real way to untie this Gordian knot of control is to free the soul of man free himself Free himself from the, as I said, the chains of bondage, the mind forged manacles that William Blake spoke of. Once that freedom comes about, and I believe that yes, we are perhaps now starting to get a small glimmer that number one, that is the way to go, and it is this spiritual work, it is, it is this holy work, and then also a few steps along, maybe trying to find the first principles of the steps of the ladder that'll help us do it. I monitor to that and say, if it continues, we're fine. I'm honored to that, and I say, if it doesn't continue, we're not fine. And I'm not going to lie to people. You're going to be in a bastille of lies. You're already under the shadow of the pyramid of some of the most toxic and evil people you could ever want to imagine. And they don't like you. And they're going to try and enslave you in whichever way they can. And they have different models of slavery. When this one starts, stops working, hey, roll it out and wheel up another one. They've got different modalities. They've got different methodologies. They've got different formulas for the slavery. This century... You know, the previous century's model doesn't work. Butchering people in the streets doesn't work. Let's bring in the media. Let's bring in mind control. Let's bring in this, this form. They're endlessly changing it, endlessly tweaking it. Just to make, and then they customize it based on the kind of person, based on the culture, based on the background, based on the race. They're able to customize these packages of control. That's and it's, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of incredible insight and a passion that you can't even believe for the average individual to keep abreast of these things. That's why I give people like yourselves incredible you know, kudos and admiration for getting out there and actually doing something about it because mm. without broadcasting this information, it's useless. You have to get out there and broadcast it so that the world can know. More and more people can hear about it. That's fundamental. Well, one of the things that we, we did talk about, myself and Steve, is that we said that when the penny drops, when people actually wake up and they realize what's going on, um, two things. One, they feel like it's a big secret that you want to tell everybody. And two, they feel that they have to go and do something. When we, when the penny dropped for us, we felt we had to do something. It wasn't good enough just sitting down and just trying to talk to people. We felt we had to do something. And, you know, I think with the, the amount of listeners that we, we, we get on the show and the feedback that we get and the, the, the guests like yourself who come on who help us educate the people out there and let them know what's going on you know we're all on the same side we're all trying to do things we're all trying to promote the information and get it out there to wake people up and well remember i would i would amend what you said a little bit because i say you're not just feeling like it and you're not just trying it you're actually doing it yeah i yeah. mean you really have to know you really look at the, the the semantics there you are doing it other people try other people feel like doing it. Other people want to do it. The thing that distinguishes the person is they are doing it. And then when you do it, it inspires the next guy over in Scotland, over in you know Birmingham, or over in France, wherever. Say, I'm going to do that too. And then they, they go out there. And this is what is very very important. And I think that, that this is definitely something that is like it's a, you know happening throughout the world right now. Is that you are having people who are really fascinated and interested in this kind of subject matter. And that is of course always to be. Uh, admired because you see that is unique in our history by the way even historically no other time in history did you have this kind of shift in which people even ask these questions first of all most of our history you couldn't even ask it even if you wanted to because you you, you know you would be in the and I can name the names by the way in the dungeon or worse so we didn't even have the opportunity to ask these things before the local priest or bishop or whoever controller or lord shall we say would deal with your ass faster than jack lightning now you have a certain modicum of freedom 
and that extends to even getting out there and publishing and writing and creating shows. So this kind of thing is definitely unique, absolutely. The, uh, we have a, a few more questions, Steve. Yes, we do. A few questions and a lot of comments, Michael. You, you're, you're, you're touching a lot of nerves with a lot of people. There's a lot of positive... I can actually feel... I can feel the positivity coming through the, through the screen here. Um, where are we? Uh, people are saying meditate, uh, reconnect. Uh, what does Michael think of um, meditation? Does Michael meditate? Uh, what's Michael's, what are Michael's thoughts on David Icke's thoughts? And where are we? Uh, Uma says, we are the ones we are waiting for. Vern says, uh, I've just lost that one. Where is it? Vern says, we really are our own worst enemies. That's it. That's basically in a nutshell. And Libya, is it, is it, just to do, did somebody wanted to know about uh, Libya. Um, what, what do you think of the bombing of Libya? Um, I haven't been tracking that, to tell you the truth, that closely. I think that, that again, I'd be very suspicious because, you see, uh, these are not enemies in, in, in the truth. Gaddafi and these people and anyone who is... Uh, all of these conflicts that you're seeing now are orchestrated by the same British intelligence, what have you. So it, it's, just, it's just Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with any of these conflicts. These conflicts are on the board and they go to them, move to them when they feel like it. Uh, to create, again, skirmishes. The whole Egyptian thing that happened was entirely orchestrated, in my opinion, and same as this Libya thing. Gaddafi is in with the team. He's part of it. He's not against it. He's part of it, in the same way that even Saddam Hussein was a part of it, and, and so many others you could mention. And when they, for instance, if they feel that they don't like somebody because he's either going insane, like Netanyahu, you see, or even Mubarak, or they're becoming too, ter they're not following along, then, yeah, they'll get rid of them. Yeah. But there's not a leader in the world today, and there hasn't been one for... I can't even mem think of how many decades, who's actually been independent and who doesn't work for this system. They're all in the system together. And if people realize that, they'll be able to see through this media BS that always makes it look like, you know, another conflict, another this and another that. And the alternative media will back up what I'm saying because you'll always find Alex Jones, David Icke, others, they'll have the facts on these political uh, machinations to show you, to prove to you that these people are all in bed together. And it's not just conflict like what we think it is. It's one maniac beating another head, another maniac over the pillow. They live on this. They thrive on this conflict. They thrive on the trauma that it creates. It's very healthy to do that, to create wars when you need to, to create conflict control when you need to. And they've got their buddies on the other side, so-called, you know, the red and the blue, the Tweedledum and the Tweedledee. Mm. And, every, and this is what I say, all the gormless people just, after how many now centuries? You think that the people have worked this out? And after the last 30 years of everybody talking about world peace and brotherhood of man and global diversity, and still none of those promises have, have ever manufactured, you'd imagine, wouldn't you, that the same rhetoric of the same politicians, almost in exactly the same words, I can scroll back and show you from 15, 20 years ago, politicians both in America and in, in Britain, saying the exact same words, almost in exactly the same way about the future of man and progress and, 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 and global stability and I mean this is such a stuck record that you'd think that even the dumbest ass retarded person would know this is just rhetoric and yet they don't they literally wave their Obama flags hope and change hope and change strength the new America over and over again you tell the Irish people vote for your own slavery yes yes to it all yes we say I mean, you still have the modicum of democracy in which the people can turn around and go, you must be kidding, we're not going to buy this, and certainly I'm going to read it first before I sign on to it. No, okay, I'll accept your chains of gold. I don't like chains of iron. Gee, I'm really against those, but chains of platinum and gold, I'm for it. I'm first in line. This is the, this is the madness, this is, and it goes back to the person's question about meditation and so on and what you do with the inner world. Unless the person is free in their mind, free of this master-slave relationship, which means free of what? Self-sadism. All right, let's stop talking about Illuminati, Queen of England, Templars, Satanic Brotherhoods. Let's talk about self-sadism, how the individual tyrannizes their own, own, own being on a daily basis, their image of their own body. I'm not tall enough. I'm not short enough. I've got too many pimples on my face. I can't lose weight. Uh, I'm not as intelligent as the other person. I'm not good-looking enough. Look at the ways in which an individual acts as big brother to his own psyche, and now you'll start to understand what Michael Stein's point is all about. There's one part of my work that's fascinated with this external model, this external outplaying, right, drama, of the control that I see outside. But I'm a highly educated person in psychology and the mystic arts, and I know that what you see outside on that screen has a projector, and that projector is consciousness, and what the ingredients of consciousness are is the predicate of everything that you see outside. 
although we forget that we get caught up in the marketplace and the chaos of the marketplace and he said she said and all of the other stuff that goes on out there but it is based on the complexion of a person's own consciousness and how they relate to their own body how they relate to their own minds how they see themselves their bodily armoring their mental armoring their masculine feminine dynamic and so on and so forth their own connection to their subconscious as the psychologist would say and on and on from there that is the projector that's the cauldron from which all the other weeds of pestilence grow you see the psyche of human beings and the, and if we're not evolved yet in astrology they talk about plutonic thinking if we're not yet in, into integrating that plutonic kind of thought well then we'll just replace one tyranny with another we'll get rid of this group but we'll have some other Genghis Khan praying over us in order for the world to be free historically from any kind of tyranny the answer is stop tyrannizing yourself understand the dynamics of tyranny understand the dynamics of control and dictatorship starting with the self and when you've understood how that works the ego you know the relationships that you have in yourself the yeah. super ego all the complexes of the human consciousness then and only then are you armored up with anything like the power to go out into the other world and change other people well, I'll tell There's you what, no other way. I'll tell you what, we have, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. One thing that we have a lot of guests agreeing on is saying to people, concentrate on your health and con concentrate on finding out who you are as a person and your own spirit spirituality. Now, we're conscious of the time, Michael, and we have, a, again, people coming in wanting to ask you questions. So I'll pass you over to Steve and, you know, very popular tonight. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> My index finger will be sore in the morning. Um, this, is go this is going back a few minutes, Michael. A question from uh, another question from Uma, and she's wondering, uh, Michael, are those evil, toxic people human? This is this is obviously in relation. To, I think this, this question is going back at least at least uh, ten, fifteen minutes. Well, the answer is obviously no. Um, they're human, but then what is human, right? Now, of course, she's probably referring to my work on Atlantis, um, and that means that. The, the, most of the, the very elite families have uh, uh, alien blood. That means yeah, they're human. Of course, they're human. But they, uh, in ancient times, my work always talks about a genetic interference, and therefore you have an alien strain in people. And there's a bloodline, what's known as a dragon bloodline, that has been highly preserved down through the centuries, regardless of what Burke's Peerage and other heraldry, heraldry experts are talking about. These royal families are a close-knit group. I mentioned some of the names earlier, like the Carolingians and Merovingians, but there's many, many others. There's even Eastern versions and so on. That's a whole separate study. So this, um, is, this is kind of a, it, it sound, it's sounding kind of similar uh, to what David Icke will be saying as, as regards to the reptilian bloodline. It's similar to a point. Yeah, me and David are good friends. Uh, totally endorse uh, the vast majority of his work. We see eye to eye on most everything. Uh, of course, as different scholars, we've come at things at slightly different angles, but those are mostly minutia, insignificant minutia. He speaks about a reptilian strain. I also do as well. I believe that the reptilians are definitely in existence, and that they can, they have crossbred with humans and all of that. Yep, totally believe in that. It's all in my Atlantis DVD, where I go into great detail there, talking about the genetic interference in ancient times from off-world creatures. And their bloodline is in all of us. It's not them against us. We have it too. Yeah. That, that, that pension. Well, it's like I was just saying a few minutes ago. The inner chaos, the inner schizoidness, is a genetic one as well. The compulsion that even every one of us has for evil acts or unjust, act, unjust acts or immoral acts is partly because of this, you know, so to, so to speak, a virus in the blood, if you will, that we ourselves are polarized, even on a genetic level. Can I just um, mention that, uh, something on this which I think is very important? And it's an incident that happened. I did receive an email from uh, someone, I won't mention any names, and obviously we have um, put, uh, we're, we'll be very interested if we can get David on the show, and David's aware of that, David Icke. And we know David talks about the reptilian, reptilian thing, and there's so many people actually, you know, going against that. But nobody with the people who have turned around to me and said, oh, you don't be talking about that, da -de -da -de -da, it's a, it'll affect the troop movement and everything else. Nobody has come to me and showed me evidence that goes against what's been said. David has more information on, you know, the possibility of that being right. And the people who are saying, well, don't go down there, don't go down that road. And when I say, well, show me the evidence that goes against what David said, yeah. they can't I show it to me. 
That happened in my own private life. When I was researching this, I didn't have to go down that road, but I, exactly the same thing happened with me. I saw the evidence for it. I had researched it independently and saw nothing but what I would consider strong evidence for it. And so I had no choice but to you know, uh, include that in my rendering of the story because I believe it, absolutely yeah. believe it, from oh. absolutely independent ancient sources. The ancient legends talk about it, and I've said umpteen times on my talks and in my books that if the ancient legends say something, I believe it to be true. I take those as facts. I know other people might not want to, but then they haven't researched it like I have. As far as I'm concerned, if something supernatural or bizarre is mentioned in an ancient legend, not one, I'll, I'll, I'm obviously not stupid, I know if it's only in one culture, well, the hell with that. But listen, when you see the same motif in thousands of different cultures, and hundreds of the most important ones that we still know, the great civilizations, it's good for enough for me to go. Because I have great admiration for those ancient sages and seers and prophets. I know they weren't dumb people. People can map the sky the way they did. Yeah, I think I might want to learn from them. I, I'm not going to think that the guy at my high school, my teacher, is up to their level. So, I mean, you know, come on. These people were smart enough to build the greatest citadels, the greatest civilization that ever existed. Yeah, I think they're good to go. And if they talk about dragon men and re reptilians and the hero going out to slaughter these people and these evil beings out there and these reptilians and these sea dragons and mermaids and, and you know, all sorts of uh, beasties and stuff, why should we condescendingly, in our modern age, when we were actually going out and genetically cloning and doing things equally as m mad, we're on the verge of doing more Frankensteinian things, why should we, with the other side of our mind, negate that when there's so much thousands of years of evidence pointing that this existed. See, so it's just, it's logical to me to be open-minded enough to say until it's disproven, exactly what you're saying, I believe everything until it's disproven, and if you can't disprove it to me, then don't tell me that it's wrong to believe in it. Exactly, that's, that's, my, that's my, my belief. If somebody's going to come up and say, you shouldn't be talking about that, I'll go, why? And they'll go, well, and I'll go, well, show me the proof. If you show me the proof that goes against what's been said, then I'll have a look at that, and then I'll make a valid dis decision. But the problem you know, is... Somebody, if somebody made a, an actual real deep discovery, one of the avenues I just simply couldn't go down myself, it was impossible. But if people want to study the freaks, you know, the, the phenomena of freak, freakishness, yep. the two-headed babies, the Siamese twins, really get into that yep. and even start including in that study the study of what they've hidden away in the backwards of some of the oldest uh, madhouses in the world, the th things that nobody in this world knows what goes on and even the doctors will never admit. What lives in those backwards, which ordinary women people your neighbors have given birth to but then it's, it's shunted away, hidden away in the back wards of, of mad houses. Study that phenomena and include in that study the study of freaks. And uh, you would not be coming back to tell David and me that uh, you're kooks. You wouldn't do it. And that's evidence. What's that all about? It's not the crap that you've been told, oh, it just happens now and again. There are some of the weirdest things you'd ever want to study. A study has never been done on this worth, worth, any, worth, worth two cents. I've, I've wanted to do it myself. and It's one of the things I've never had real time to do. But to study what exists and lives in those back wards, it would take somebody with a medical background you see, to even be able to get in there to, to really, really bring this teachings to the world. And study along with that the so-called phenomena of freakism, giantism, um, uh, dwarfism, Siamese twins, uh, a hairy be webbed, People have webbed fingers, webbed feet. The whole, we know about it, the whole smog yeah. board of that kind yeah. of study needs to really be taken on board and studied, but in line with what we're talking about, yeah. about the alternative ways of, of, of what exists on this planet that has been carefully hidden away. That's that would it. open lots of eyes. I, th I think I think there's a lot of stuff out there that we just we, we, we we're not aware of and we don't know about. And you know as well as I do, as well as Steve does, that we are conditioned to believe throughout our life a certain things because that's the way society is. And then when somebody challenges some your belief system, your uh, ego kicks in and stops us from actually thinking outside the box and going, "Hey, what's the possibility of that happening?" They're so conditioned in their life and in their belief system that they just totally go against you and say no that's not possible and you say well prove to me that it's not possible and they can't do it it's just a yeah. conditioning that they, they've been so conditioned but I'm going to pass over to Steve again and Steve's just going to go through a few more questions there right uh <laughs> I don't know if you well obviously you do have a computer in front of you Michael you should be on this chat box there's a, there's a lot of people singing your praises uh, some people are saying that you you, you you put Alex Jones to shame you, you're, you're so good in what you say uh, a lot of people saying that a lot of information that you have given out uh, has, has been uh, proven to be absolutely spot on correct 
Um, uh, still going back to one that, 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 that someone is looking for an answer. Does Michael meditate? Uh, when can we see Michael in Dublin? And I'm gonna, I am definitely gonna pronounce this one wrong because uh, I just know I am. Uh, what are Michael's thoughts on P L A E I D E S? Is uh, play these. Play, play. Is that yeah, what play these? Yeah, play these. Star system. All right. Mm. Wow. Yeah, well, I don't know too much about it except that. Uh, it figures in ancient Egyptian cosmology, certainly the Celts, the Irish, you know, the Pleiades. I'm not, I mean, I can't really think specifically anything more about it. You know, I mean, Sirius plays a big role in my work and uh, so, and uh, various other constellations and stars, of course. But uh, Pleiades doesn't really mean that much to me specifically. Uh, what was the other question? Um, do you meditate and when can we see you in Dublin? Well, that's private. I, I always make a point. It's not just on your show, but in general, I've always made the point that I don't speak about my personal life. I try to have people make the focus on my public work. Who I am and what I do it should be absolutely not important to anyone. Um, you know, it should be what I'm doing. Who I'm hanging out with, who I know, what I do in my life, what kind of food I eat is irrelevant. You know, it's the yeah. focus now, and believe me, if people were really passionate, that is, they wouldn't need to be told this. Right now, we're in a very, very dark place in the world. And not just with me, but with all of these people. You see so much of this banter back and forth on various forums and chat rooms and YouTube about oh, all these people's personal lives, Alex and me and, and whoever else. But the point is, I take offense against that, not because it's an invasion in my personal private space, but secondly, what are you thinking? You know, what has that person got time to wonder about, well, you know, what, uh, that I'm wearing a leather jacket or, you know, who I might be hanging out with or, you know, whatever it might be, or I'm smoking a cigarette? You know, is that where your concern is? When I am sitting there, going to my wit's end to put out information that is absolutely radical in this world, see, it tells me where that person's focus is, that they get time to chew bubblegum over that, but they're not even making a single comment or interest in the actual work, the deep meat of the material of what we're talking about. And that, I don't have time for people like that. But even more than that, you know, it's just I don't, I don't think my life is very interesting to people, so I, you know, don't go into it. What I would say is that I do believe that people should study meditation, study what system works for them, really research these subjects, they're very interesting, and then come to their own conclusions about what works for them, absolutely. I think they should be absolutely studying all of these different things with an open mind to find out what works for them, you know. But okay. see, here's, the other, here's another reason. If I say, yes, I do, then people gormlessly go, well, if he does it, I'm going to try it. See, so now I'm a dictator. Now I'm an authority that yeah. just because yeah. Michael meditates or Michael's into Buddhism, you know, Michael's into this, they rush off and, you know, this is the way the world is. I'm sorry, it happens. And if I say, no, I'm not into that, then they drop it, when in fact it might be a very good thing for them. Everybody's waiting for Big Daddy, the authority figure, to say, here's what I do in my life. Our world is full of this nonsense. And then we want to do the same thing. The sheep of mentality at work again. Yes, exactly. And I'm not into that at all, you know. I'm not into that at all. It's really something I personally despise in life when I see it myself. Uh, not to mention, that's not to say I don't have my heroes, I do. But when it becomes very overt, where people are literally copying, you know, this is the whole Oprah Winfrey s scenario we're into. You know, I'm not into that. I'm into making people free in their minds to be able to go and say, who am I? Okay. Michael, because we like to run a, a, a balanced show, we, we, we don't want to dictate to people, uh, another, another comment has come in, which I'm going to just read it out anyway, and you can, you, you can comment on it, but it's, it's, uh, it just says, uh, Come on, lads, these guys, Ike, Maxwell, Tessarian, are all NWO agents. How come all videos exposing them are being removed uh, from the net? And then uh, there's another question following that. Are you referring to, uh, to Chris White? And uh, so they say yes, and uh, Chris White is a religious zealot. So I don't know if you have any comments on, on, on that one. He's coming on the show, by the way, Chris White. Okay. <laughs> Just in case, <laughs> if you look at the radio schedule, actually, like, see, Chris White is coming on the show. Okie dokie. Right, okay. That's, um, oh. that's down the line. Um, uh, I say Michael probably have heard, has heard of Chris White anyway. Well, I have, of course, and I know that he's one of many people. When John Coleman, one of the greatest uh, conspiracy authors, was ever asked, uh, who has he, because remember he was XMI5, he's a person who came up against very, very senior opposition, extremely high level, higher level than you can imagine. But when he was asked about who his real opponents were, he mentioned only two groups, Christian right-wing fanatics like Chris White, uh, not Chris White specifically in Coleman's case, but that kind of creature, and the homosexual group, wow. elite homosexual you know, groups who are this cabal that run the rock and run the rap 
and I, again, if people aren't familiar with all of this, of how powerful the homosexual networks are in the world, along with this extreme right-wing Christian fundamental group, these people are the ones who will attack and fight us. So they're either used by the Illuminati themselves or other more sinister groups to come after and try to debunk and try to, you know, misconstrue, mostly importantly. And then I'm not against it because I say, look, everyone should have the freedom to say what they want. So it's where I draw the line is that they, of course, always try to get into your personal life and make personal, you know, uh, comments and, and, and stabs in the dark. And if they can't throw stones, you know, they'll throw sand in your eyes. These, again, are that group that I told you about earlier that stand in the way of true revelation. And because what they, they don't, they don't mess with me. I don't mind what they do. They have no effect on me. But what they do have an effect on is those good people who might be trying to come to my work or trying to understand what is going on, and then they get all lost in this confusion, you see. So it doesn't affect me directly, but it affects good people. It makes their job a lot harder. But again, you know, this is what you have to deal with. If I, was to compare, if I was to compare the rubbish that they think they're doing towards me than what I've had in my personal life, it doesn't even show up, so they might as well waste their time. The opposition I've had from other sources far exceeds what they think they're ever doing to me, and in fact, they actually assist me in many ways. They look like chumps, and I look fantastic. You know, the more rubbish they throw at me, the better I look, so keep it coming. So, obviously, obviously, you're... You're following your path, and these people who step on your way—I mean, at the end of the day, they're only going to end up, end up looking like fools. But uh, well, it's more than that, obviously. When they I'll accuse you of being a Mason or a Rosicrucian or a Templar, or what was the, they were saying? I work for the New World Order. I mean, I don't even really actually know even what that means. What, what, is, a, what is a New World Order agent exactly? You know, so I mean, and the illogicism of it should be obviously. I shouldn't even have to even comment on it because the illogicism of it should be obvious to anyone with a logical mind. And Chris White doesn't have a logical mind, so that's why he spews out this rubbish, and everybody listens to him. Uh, you know, they they buy into because they're equally paranoid, fanatical, and and basically spiritually lost. And all these all these people are internet lice. They're internet parasites who have nothing better to do but ride on the coattails of people who are trying to get the truth out to people. But I will go more than that. I'm telling you directly that these people, as John Coleman has confirmed, work for or are in league with very powerful organizations who don't want to come after you directly because they expose themselves. So they send these uh, homosexual groups, powerful homosexual groups, and this Christian fundamental right wing. If you track back to any of the great minds who've spoken on these subjects, you will find that that is exactly the same coterie who try to take them out, or who try to, you know, um, uh, who try to stir up a lot of controversy. It's the same pattern, the same groups who are used in order to come in and try and misconstrue what you're talking about. It's not that my work is perfect and it doesn't have small errors here and there, but so does any science book. Every book, even technical book in a manual in a school, is having errata. You fix it, you change it. I, I collaborate a lot. So I get information from a lot of other people that updates my information, or, or, or a person may correct something I've done. This is an ongoing process, a partly collaborative process. We're all looking for the truth. I've never set myself up as a master or an expert in anything. We're all discovering a very incredible thing together, you know? And we will make mistakes, and we will break fingernails, and we will, uh, you know, bite down on things that are not right. But who are these other so-called nobodies, with no books, no DVDs, no clout, coming in as if they're critics, and all they are is low-class cynics, they don't even have any substantial knowledge about anything, not even the stuff that they're meant to be teaching themselves, and come in and dare to be commenting on my work. Who the hell are they? You know, we're, I never set myself up as any expert. I'm working with what I've got, the means what I've got, to create as much as I can, and if it turns people on, it's fine. And if it doesn't, you change the channel. Go on and study somebody else that you like better. So when you see this overt action, though, an overt action to try and scandalize and plagiarize and just completely boulderize good people trying to do great work, you know that that is not them just getting up of a day and thinking, you know, that's what I want to do. And when you map it out over the years, you find out that it's the same coterie, a very sinister coterie doing this to try and take people like me out. Well, they're not going to succeed. Okay, L Michael, we're conscious of time, and we might be running over, and I think we might have to run over, because there's still so much that we have to talk about. There's this co a co an announcement I'd like to make, which there's a chap here on our chat called Finn35, 
He said in Aberdeen on the 26th of March, some friends and himself will be handing out flyers, DVDs about NWO, 9-11, etc. So if you're in Aberdeen on the 26th of March, Finn and his friends are going to be handing out education information regarding uh, the NWO and everything else related to the topic. Um, and also another one there from Finn as well. Now, I don't know, I profess I don't know anything about football, but uh, Finn, Finn thinks, Michael, that you look like George Samaras of Celtic FC, except George has long hair. I don't know if that's a comment. Or a uh, compliment, uh, isn't compliment. it? Um, well, good, luck on, good luck on their, you know, going out there to uh, spread the word. I wish them the best of luck with that. Yeah, no problem. Um, good luck, Finn, with, uh, with the work you're going to do there. The, yeah. other, the, the other thing is um, just Dublin. We have to get, get some information from Michael. Um, we've had a couple of requests, Michael, saying, when are you coming over here to actually do a lecture? Oh, I'd love to. It's just the right time and the right place. I'm involved in so many projects, and they all have deadlines, of course, and once you start them, you have to complete them. But absolutely, I know if, if something happens in the, the right kind of uh, event, I'm pretty, you know, careful about the people that I will work with, you know, because of their integrity and so on and forth and so on. But surely if the right kind of event takes place, or even if I, I've even considered doing one my, on my own, you know, and, and hosting one on my own. So there's, there's lots of different irons in the fire there. Um, but again, I don't necessarily go out to promote myself, you know, it's connected, again, it undercuts what a lot of these other uh, critics, so-called critics of mine, you know, would say about me, is I've never advertised myself, people, every interview people have come to me, everybody who buys my book, they come and find me somewhere, if I'm known, it's only because of other people spreading the word, I've never gone out there to heavily advertise myself, I don't have my own radio show or media network or anything like that, you know, I'm invited to places, from day one it was like that. So I'm not forcing anybody to do anything. I'm not spreading any news. People come to me and take my knowledge and then they go spread it. So how do my critics say, he's out there spreading this Luciferian whatever? I'm not spreading anything. I, I, I didn't even know that a single copy of any of my books or DVDs would sell. If they did, it's because, well, that's not out of my control and it's a good thing. Should I be, you know, uh, should I be ashamed about that? Absolutely not. If I'm admired by people who love my work and it's shining light on the meaning of their lives, who the hell is somebody else to come along and debunk that and say that that's a bad thing? You know, it's ridiculous. I'm not out there doing anything. And I can tell you again, as I've told many people, I belong to no associations. I belong to no cults. I despise all secret societies. My whole life has been dedicated to exposing secret societies. So, like you said earlier on about the logic of debunking the reptilians, show me the evidence. Doesn't the same formula apply? If you're going to say that Michael Desiron is a spreader of such and such and such and he's working for the system, please show me your evidence. And when I say evidence, I don't mean wild ad hominem attacks on my person or just because I happen to live within three miles of the Rosicrucian Center center in San Jose, I must be a Rosicrucian along with the other 500,000 people who also live within two miles of that location, and this is what we're talking about. So, you know, that doesn't add up to any logical person. Show me the evidence. They can't show the evidence. Just because my mother knew some people in the so-called New Age movement, that makes me a New Age, and New Age guru, and so on 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 and so on. It goes on, doesn't it? Pe people make up their own kind of, they, they read into things, don't they, and just make up their own mind, and then Chinese whispers, and before you know it, there's a rumor going around which is completely false so again right. show us show us the evidence that's that's my motto and um, well what it does is it, it's going to separate the sheep from the goats because what will happen then is again I say let them have the freedom to say what they want but then what happens is the person who believes it and sucks it all in I prefer that they have nothing to do with my work I'm not interested in changing their ways if they want to remain Christian let them remain Christian I'm not after them I am a scholar who points out inconsistencies in the Bible and in all religions and, and, and show the background. If you're into it, you're into it. If you, but I'm not against a person believing in Jesus. I'm not in, in any way telling person, nor have I ever, ever said okay, that well, somebody should not believe in Muhammad or somebody should not personally believe in the Christ. I've never, ever said that. But what I have always targeted is the institutions of religion that I believe are part of this you know, matrix of mind control. That's all I've said. Instead of joining hands and saying, you know, Michael, great work, you're right, and you certainly haven't uh, got in my personal faith. You're not in the way of my personal faith. In fact, you've even endorsed that on so, so many times you've said that you're not interfering with the private beliefs of private people. I've said that from the stage. I've said it on interviews and said it all over the place. You know, instead of being admiring a person for being like that, they're going to try and tear you down. Well, that shows who they are. That's the, uh, again, the sheep of mentality, the conformist um, mm -hmm. attitude. Now, we're just, I'm just keeping an eye on time there, Michael. We do, we, we, you know, I, I don't, we don't mind overrunning because the topic I want to, t I want to um, get you to touch base on now is quite important. 2012, 
we want to, uh, I'd just like to get your opinion and your take on what you perceive as happening. You know Obama and the Queen's coming over in May. Just talk about October being a substantial shift. Whether it's a conscious shift or a planetary shift, I don't know. And obviously we know about the Mayan you know, um, predictions regarding 2012. Do, do you have two camps. I have read both sides. I've researched both sides, and Steve has researched both sides. One side is saying we're going to have devastation on the planet as the planet realigns. It's it's our plan. It's our balance by about 15 degrees. And you have the other people saying we won't feel anything. It'll be just a conscious shift, and then that will be it. What's and based on your research, what have you found out? Um, well, I take on board all of these theories, of course, but again, my central focus is what's happening in consciousness. And what's happening in consciousness is not just a, uh, happening at the date of 2012, it's been part of a quite a long cycle. Some could say, you know, 13 years, some say a bit longer, what, what have you. Well, basically, since the new millennium changed over in 2000, the countdown to 2012 has been a cycle uh, in which, right now, you are going to see, hopefully see, that people start understanding this dynamic of how psychic energy affects material energy based on what we were saying earlier about when people take responsibility for their thinking and their emotions and their bioenergy then you will see fundamental shifts first and foremost in their own personal lives secondly in their relationships then in their community and then in the world at large it's no different than when a child is born that child knows nothing but the breast of the mother it doesn't even know itself a little bit later, it discovers that it's a member of a, a small family, uh, a male and a female. Then it gets the understanding that there's a bit of a broader family, right? The household, in other words. Yeah. Then it discovers there's something out the window there, a uh, neighborhood. Then it goes to school and realizes that other kids similar, if not identical to itself. Uh, then it understands something about a society, a city. From the city, it knows it's a, a part of a planet, a world. And then later, if its brain continues to function, which is often not the case, it starts asking questions about the universe at large and God and what have you. So it's just in exactly the same way as this ever-evolving Russian dolls, right, situation goes. One reality is nestled inside another reality. In this reality, people have to do it in reverse. They've got to start understanding that their concerns for the metaphysical, the philosophical, the religious, the social, the domestic, they need to sort of bring the focus back, not exclusively, obviously, but they need to bring the focus back to the self. And we're getting an opportunity to do that, and that's what this 2012 turnaround is all about. Instead of running around in a, in a super hyper-collectivized manner, which is what I see throughout the world, and there's good reasons for that, the conditioning to make people, you know, we always say, why don't you think for yourself? Thinking for yourself, nobody thinks for themselves. Everybody thinks collectively. You think, as you said earlier, because of their condition to think, and they go along with that routine, just like the sheeple. Well, thinking for oneself now needs to become a motto. And they really need to understand what that really means. What is it that is distinctive about you? What is it in your consciousness that really is you, that hasn't been put there by the society and the community and the other affiliations? That's why you get such a rebuttal towards the teachings of people like myself from these groups, these coteries. It's not just the ones we're speaking about, but others as well. They resist it because you're pulling them out of this collectivism, this hive mentality. The Christian mode is a very hive mentality, the Islamic thing. So as there's a push on one side towards 2012, towards individualism in the true sense of the word, you have a massive, and I don't need to tell people this, they can see it for themselves, a massive galvanizing of all those collective factors that are, have been the bane of all history. That's what you see. It's a polarization. It's a contrast. It's a juxtaposition. Well, as man tries to free himself from the chains of man, as Ayn Rand said, I'm alive here, I'm writing, my job is to free man from humanity, free man from man, so that he stands alone as an individual, because that is the only true creator, that is the only thing that builds civilization, is an individual thinking man, with true independence, psychically and in every other way. And if you have the psychic independence, you'll soon have the social independence and so on. And that's been lacking in our world for a long, long time now. And the collectivists, their agenda for the so-called global village that we've been referring to, one, people have to know that that's made of certain ingredients. And the very first ingredient, the very first and main ingredient of anything to do with global village or anything that you might construe that that means, as Patrick McGowan showed so beautifully in his work, is collectivism. Absolute, 100% chronic collectivism. In which you don't have to think for yourself. It's that Orwellian dystopia in which you know you may not be wearing gray uniforms like they dramatized it but you will be wearing a uniform of sorts in your mind 
Today, all the kids, the teens, everybody in the world that you can think of today, from Tokyo to West Coast America to, to you know, Venice Beach, everybody has an illusion of individualism. Everybody has an individual because they can wear this fashion, they can be into that fashion, they can you know drink this kind of coffee, and they can like that TV show. It's all an illusion, a veneer of individualism or difference, when in fact underneath it, it's a complete samity, because it's samity in consciousness, it's samity in attitude. It's certainly samity in, in an individual's relationship to their own self. They're not interested in their own self. They're running away from their own individuality. They can't wait to join some other group or get married or whatever it might be, to lose themselves in some cause. And so even in the so-called conspiracy movement, I notice this same trend. I'm going to be very blunt about it, that even in this great movement, you still see some of that same uh, you know, um, pernicious thing entering in, in which there's still a focus too much on the external. If we could just get rid of Big Brother, if we could just stop the war. I mean, that's been going on for centuries. How come people don't realize that that doesn't work? Because people are in the groove of losing their selfhood in any way that they can. Mm. So to come back to the point that you've been asking, is that now the celestial clock is simply assisting us. It's not going to do the work for us, believe me. Yeah. But the planetary alignments and the way that the zodiac is right now does mirror a certain period, a certain phase, in which a certain kind of light will be shown, so to speak, in which a person who is toying with these ideas might have things happen in their life that help them along the road to come to that great sense of psychic sovereignty. And then what happens on the other side is that those who resist it will have hell on earth. So the very things that you see or other people see that are what considered traumatic on the world today, all of that put taken together, whether it's economic or what have you, I know again, I can justify my whole premise that is again, I say it's rooted in the, in the psyche of man because it's brought about because man has this once peculiarity. He only learns, he only changes, as Schopenhauer so beautifully pointed out, when he suffers. So the other side of this dynamic the other side of the psyche, like Carl Jung said, that which you do not make conscious will appear in front of you as fate. Well, what is appearing in front of us as fate now, both in the domestic situation and people's intimate relationships? And I know that the people listening to the sound of my voice right now know exactly what I'm talking about. And in the work environment, and then in the love life environment, and then the social environment, all that meltdown, you know, I don't know how many ways I can say it, but I'll say it again, is, is based on the psyche of the individual. That reality is projected from the reality of how you relate and see yourself, highly colored by the conditioning that you've had from that world. Obviously, it's a feedback loop. The way you see yourself is based on how people have made you see yourself and so on. But you've got to untangle yourselves from that cross. You've got to come down from that twisted rope where there are these two demons on your shoulder, you know, the, the demon of how the world has made you see yourself and then how you yourself inwardly have corroborated in that dictator, in dictatorship and, and do see yourself. So at 2012, there's a chance now that the glue fades and you can pull apart. You can magically get in there and separate and basically cut these demons down. The demon of how, the, how you've been conditioned, you can get a handle on that. And this own inner punitive voice that makes you far less than who you can be, you have the chance to wring its frickin' neck. And that is what the good thing, but that's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice and a lot of, in the, in the early stages, what appears to be loss for people because it's, you're actually doing something that's a very holy work. And those who can't do it have no choice at all. They can't stay where they were. They've got to run back for safety into the collective. So what you're seeing now in 2012 is a splitting of the ways. Those who are just going to be dying to have their RFID chip shoved up their ass and a barcode on everything that they've bought, and a global currency, and a world dictator, a smiling dictatorship. They can't wait, because the last thing that those people want is anything to do with selfhood, uh, Stephen Allen. They're the last people who want anything to do with true psychic sovereignty, and the, and the uh, counterpoint to that, the fail-safe for that, the, the uh, perfect escape for that, the only escape that they can now have, apart from self-annihilation, is social annihilation. Get involved with the global world, and you're going to see millions of people lining up, as they're already doing, sitting quiescently waiting for the guru, the pope, the world leader, the, the, you know, the new dictator to tell them, to lead them, to goad them, and to basically give them the cushions and the salt and the gruel. The other group is going to have to take on that Siddhartha road and the thorns that you have to cross 
And they, of course, are always a minority, and they're always going to suffer, and they're always going to have a sacrifice loss, and have sacrifices and losses. But they're going to have to individually come to their own conclusion whether or not they want to walk that path. They have the choice to do so. They can either uh, go towards this whole dystopian thing and believe what these uh, Pied Pipers are talking about, or they will maintain and try their hardest to remain within a state of in the true psychic independence. Because there is no such thing as political freedom. There is no such thing as political sovereignty. Why chase after it? Why form political parties to get it? It doesn't exist. It's a theory. It's a chimera. Mm -hmm. The only kind of independence you have is attitudinal, mental, psychic, spiritual, emotional uh, you know, see, independence. The rest is just a complete... PR spin from the world controllers to make you think if you do this and this and this and then, then the myth of progress that you're going to work towards it, work towards it, work towards it. Yeah, you'll have peace and harmony, but it'll be the draconian peace and harmony of a robotoid, android, cyber, post-human who's not even thinking like a human being, like so many great shows like Doctor Who and Blake Seven and what have, all our, we, we know this, we've seen it, it's been portrayed in umpteen movies, The Matrix and what have you. We're going to be that perfect cyber creature who's basically a remote control program post-human. That's, that's the harmony that you're talking about. So yeah, they'll talk a lot about harmony and peace. Yeah, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about taking away the emotion, giving you a drug, putting an implant where you don't even have to feel anymore. It, I think at the end of the day, with the, you know, if you look at things like the Georgia Guidestones and the fact that we're getting um, our food getting uh, contaminated with so many chemicals, we do know that the uh, eugenics program is in place, and they're trying to do that because 500 million people are much easier to control than, than uh, six billion. That's right. And then they're working on the organic computer. They're working hard as they can to make the supercomputer capable, capable of consciousness, which will then create so many what are known as simulacras or hyper-realities. In fact, we're already bathed in hyper-reality right now. But when the supercomputer that has consciousness comes about, and they're only a hair's breadth away from creating it, that computer will create so many virtual realities in local vernacular, what they really are, hyper-realities or simulacras, that what that will, the sum total of that will, we will not even know our reality anymore because it will be identical to the realities that are then virtually created. So they all blend together and therefore we lose the last roots or connections we have. In other words, let me make a more simple metaphor. If they can go out and clone a redwood, uh, you're going to take a, you know, a newborn infant and say, which one's the clone tree? Which one has its roots in ancient seeds going back millennia? And which one did we make yesterday? And you can't tell the difference? That's what I mean. When this computer facts, uh, creates these hyper-realities, which then are then put into bricks and mortar versions in the world, a person will not even know what the real reality was. Reality itself is going to go extinct. The kind of consciousness that registered reality, meaning human consciousness, well, the post-human 2.0 human will be extinct. He's already going extinct. So that's why, it's, and by the way, that still comes under the heading of your question of 2012, because I do not, I am not in any way similar to the other people speaking on 2012. I am not thinking it's going to be some trans moment of transcendence in any kind of global collectivist way. They always imply a collectivist transcendence. Well, no, sorry, I don't buy into that at all, because you might as well, be, you might, that's the same thing I'm trying to talk against. Okay. Anything to do with a collectivistic thing is a pure big brother talismanic, bogus reality. I don't rule out individual awakening. That is happening, but it's happening on a very still and silent individual, private level. The 2012 marks the death of human 1.0, creation of transhuman, post-human individual with no emotion, hating, his, hating, hating himself, hating the, 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 the feelings he has within his own being, wanting to get rid of them at any cost, either pharmaceutically or again, running into any other escapism that can possibly be provided for him, the acceptance of any virtual reality. I don't dock, I don't like my emotions, I don't like who I am as an emotional being. I can't deal with it, I don't want to do the hard psychological work to get out of it. Give me some panacea. Well, they're working overtime. Go to my forum. You said earlier in the program, mm -hmm. or you said that one of the people who, who uh, typed in there said that, Michael, a lot of your theories have been corroborated. Well, damn right they have. Yeah. I keep a track of it on my own forum, not for, for some vanity purpose. I, I'm just doing it as a scholar saying, hey, this theory we talked about earlier, hey, here's some confirming proof over it, whereas King Tut's DNA or the solar flares of the sun, or, you know, I try to keep a track on this. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is happening right now, where the doctors, these scientists, these orbs, all Templar run, by the way, are working overtime to create that super drug, that super implant, 
all of these methodologies, these hypnotic or, or uh, panhypnotic techniques, so that you don't even have to deal with yourself as an emotional entity. Emotions are gone. Emotion, feeling is gone. Conscience is well. Conscience is already gone. And so you operate based when 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 the human is removed, all you have is a pseudo self, yeah. and that pseudo self is programmable by the collective. The collective decide w what school you go to, what you think, what you buy, you know, what you vote for, and so on and so on and so on. And just to give up your own self because it, it's painful to be a self to go through all those agonies of life and to walk the road of enlightenment it's very difficult it's like going uphill on a mountain it, it bruises your knees mm. you know it hurts well, well, it's, uh, it, takes, it, takes it, takes it takes energy to actually make the effort and put the work in and a lot of energy a lot yeah. of energy and I really do believe that 2012 is a period in which a lot of people are, are now going to decide once and for all no, no I can't do it yeah, I, I, I want Big Brother. I want it. I want it. Big Brother has no power. Believe me. Write this down. Burn it into the mind. Big Brother has no power of its own to do dick. Yeah. Without the uh, collaboration and subconscious acceptance of the masses, mm. it's a dance. It is a relationship. Any master-slave relationship is a relationship. Any relationship is a relationship. You know, you're all in the court of the king. So what, what one part of the board does, the other part responds. It is absolutely a ballet. It's not them coming and saying, you know, you're going to do as we say. It can't happen that way. They know that. In the early stages, you don't know that and you think it is. You think it's just one big tyrant with a boot stamping in the face of humanity. No, it's the humanity asking, stamp in my face. Can we get around that kind of illogicism in our world? Then we'll start understanding what we are. We've done it to everybody in our family. We've let our parents do it to us. We've let our teachers do it to us. We've let our gurus and priests do it to us. We do it to ourselves. And until we turn the mirror on and go, my God, look what I allowed to happen to myself. Mm. No more. Then, and only then, does the spirit work with you to say, now you have the power. Now Excalibur is removed from the stone. And we need to we need to get the information out. We need to get the people out there to wake them up, which is what we're doing, which is part and parcel of... We're on the but show, we're trying to wait, educate the people. for another misguided person, if you say, yeah, if you turn to another misguided person and say, hand me my sword, as loving as, and good as that person is, but they themselves are misguided. If you seek guidance from the misguided, you know, and you try to seek for your bullets and your armor and your sword and your sheath and, your, and all the rest of it from another person who doesn't know where it's at, how can that work? You can't bring millions of shards together and hope that it's going to be a beautiful statue. It's not going to happen. You may call it oneness, but it's not oneness. It's just a bunch, a heap of broken shards. Mm. That's, um, you know, it's, it's so enlightening to know that, you know, more and more people, for some, this time in our life is, is very important, and the consciousness of the planet is changing. I've, I can see people, people, people around me who are more politically aware, and people beginning to actually wake up and ask questions, and believe and know that the system is wrong and needs to be changed. Yeah. Well, I'll yeah. tell you what, Michael, we're, we're at that time, and um, we're going to be finishing up now, but, you know, that was fantastic. Now, normally, what we normally do, Steve, is we normally play music in between and stuff, but there's just so much information, and I, you know what, you know, we're going to have to get you back, if you don't mind coming back, because I reckon we have another two hours, and probably more. Yeah. Th I have a host of questions that I still want to ask you, but we've run out of time. Um, so definitely, like, if you, if, if you would come back in a, in a, in a you know, couple of months' time and talk to us, and then we'll carry on, because even the stuff that we said we'd cover before we started the show, we haven't even touched on that yet. So you can imagine the, uh, the mountain of information that we want to talk about is phenomenal. But... Um, um, what we'll say, Michael, is just, listen, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Our, our visitors and our chat facility has been going manic. People have been on putting loads of questions in. We so apologize to all our um, uh, chat users. There's a few questions there that we didn't, didn't get to Michael because it's just it's such a... A fun-packed show with loads of information. What can we say? I think we'll have to we'll have to do this again. I think we'll have to do that. But I'll just say, Michael, you know, thanks again um, for me anyway for being on the show, uh, Steve. Yeah, just uh, one last comment that I'm uh, going to read out there. I think kind of would sum it up uh, from one of our posters, a cyber debate. He says, "Well, he speaks the truth as hard as, as hard as it is to take in." 
So I mean, yeah, I mean, all we can say, Michael, is it's 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 powerful information. I know there are, there will be a lot of people listen, and they they won't believe a word of it. Some people may, but I mean, I, uh, I'm I'm guessing that you would probably. Uh, advocate that people go and do their own research and, and not take everything that you say as verbatim I mean I'm sure I'm sure that's something you you would agree oh I fundamentally that's fundamental and I make a lot of uh, references and sources and I encourage people to do that absolutely I even understand the people who have resistance because what we're talking about here is no small thing we're cutting through the skin you know the webs of millennia and, and they're on many different levels and frequencies as well. So it is a huge task, and not everybody is up to it. I'm one of the one of the things that differentiates me from a lot of the other speakers is I know that this is not to be got by everyone. By the way, I'm not a collectivist in any shape or form. I know that this is only going to be a small, intelligent, spiritually empowered group that even even starts to begin to get this. Never in my work ever or in my personal life have ever deluded myself for an instant that this has anything to do with anything global or anything to do you know, with, with a mass movement of any kind. I've never deluded myself uh, to that regard. But again, regarding coming on in the future, I'd be delighted to do that. The questions are excellent, and it's wonderful to hear that two Irish guys are doing this. It's absolutely fantastic. So, you know, keep up the good work, and I'd be delighted to come on in the future. Absolutely. Excellent. Good stuff. Michael, just before before we wrap things up, uh, your website, michaeltesorian.com, uh, I'm assuming if pe people go there, can they... Uh, purchase books and DVDs if they want to check out uh, any more of your work oh yeah all the DVDs are there the books are there you know go on to the Michael Tessarian site uh, I've got about 14 15 different sites but if you go on to the michaeltessarian.com site uh, then you'll get to all of those various sites lots of information there lots of good stuff lots of updated information again on the forum and people can always send me interesting things that they find and I'll put it up on the forum and I have to say that, you know, graphically, a very, very good uh, designed website. I have to say that. We have a message from Iona on the chat, and she has asked us a few times uh, about this. She wants to know, when is Michael coming to Dublin? Well, we answered that earlier. It says, I just yeah. don't know. Uh, you know, I'm so absorbed, absorbed in the, product, the projects that I'm doing right now that it, it takes up every second of my time. But uh, that doesn't rule out, you know, various events. It's just when the right people and the right timing and, and they have to be people of integrity, super integrity, you know, people of great integrity and belief in what they're doing, not just profiteers, mm. you know, then when I get contacted from the right people in the right time and the right venue, I'll be delighted to come over there and do it. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll have to put the, uh, the feelers out for that. Can you just stay with us there for a minute, Michael, while we wrap yeah. things up? And we'll, yeah. we'll be back to you in a minute. Bear with us. Okay.